Welcome to our discussion of John Locke, who is the last political philosopher we will study more closely. Uh, he is, as I mentioned before, a, contract, a contractualist uh, philosopher who, just like uh, John, uh, like Thomas Hobbes, has um, imagined society uh, uh, in terms of political society in terms of a social contract. This is why we uh, can make parallels and um, study him together or immediately after uh, Thomas Hobbes. They were actually contemporary. <coughs> Both of them lived uh, during the time of the, well, the most turbulent century in uh, British history, um, the um, times of the Glorious Revolution and of the uh, Civil War, um, as we discussed uh, when we talked about Hobbes. John Locke, however, who was born after Hobbes, but they overlap. <coughs> John Locke, however, reaches slightly or significantly different uh, results in his theory of uh, uh, how a political uh, society should look like, what is the purpose of living together, and so on. But just like any other serious uh, political thinker, uh, John Locke as well <coughs> starts from the essential questions, right? What is the human being? Uh, what is uh, the purpose of society? And together, what is the best life for the human being and for the society? The same questions we have discussed and studied uh, throughout. And you, as, as we talk about John Locke, you will notice, I'm already pointing this out, how familiar he will sound. How, and why is that? Is it because he's more right, more correct, or is it because our system in which we live, especially in the United States, but not only, uh, the modern system of so-called liberal democracy. Uh, liberal not in the sense in which, you know, it's used politically in the United States. <coughs> so this system of liberal democracy is based on some of the assumptions on which John Locke himself uh, builds his whole political thought. So, John Locke will sound familiar, for good reason, because we ourselves live in a political society built on the same assumptions. Uh, so yes, this is not the only way to live. We ourselves have philosophical assumptions, philosophical foundations, which we usually don't examine anymore. This idea of individual rights, liberties, freedoms, whatever, this is not a given. These are all philosophical assumptions. And one of the reasons for studying all these approaches to the question, what is man, what is the human being, what is society, what is the best life, right, is to see that there's not only one answer. And it would be a mistake to start from our assumptions and without questioning them, without inquiring into them, to just throw judgments on thinkers, other thinkers, just because what? They lived before us. And purely they were not as intelligent, therefore they didn't have iPhones. Uh, so clearly, that's not the case. Uh, political philosophy teaches you to understand and inquire into your own assumptions, into your own political assumptions, to ask why freedoms, why rights, where from, based on what. So, John Locke, <coughs> born in 1632, died in 1704, lived during the turbulent century that I mentioned, wrote, uh, similar to Hobbes, he wrote a theory of epistemology, meaning a theory about human understanding. And actually one of his uh, important writings is called An Essay of, on Human Understanding. In other uh, words, he asked, what are we as human beings? And how do we know things? This is the question, right? What are human beings? For him, it was uh, examined during, uh, within the essay on human understanding. So, what are some important aspects to then go to the uh, theory of the state of nature? Well, one thing is that human beings do have reason. So, there is such a thing as reason, unlike in Hobbes' review, where it works a little bit differently. But it's similar to Hobbes that this reason we get, what we know, although we have reason that can understand, right, just like in Plato, 
What we know is what we gather through our senses from the surrounding. Right? Why, however, why can we know? Right? What is it that makes us able to know? And this is a very important question. Right? Uh, here's the world, right? And the world is order. There are things that work in a certain way, right? That's what knowledge gives you. Knowledge gives you um, uh, the uh, <coughs> recognition of these uh, linkages, the recognition of these connections, right? That's what knowledge is. Knowledge is when I know, so the fact that I know something means that I'm able to recognize certain connections, certain logical relationships, right? That's what knowledge is, right? Uh, <coughs> Understanding the uh, gravity, right? The theory of gravity means that I recognize the magnetic connection between uh, objects, which is gravity, right? I might not be able to explain it, but the fact that I am able to recognize it is my reason's ability to, to know. And that, again, is true for morals, for all other aspects of human existence. Reason is that capacity of our minds to match the order in the world. In other words, in our little minds, <laughs> right, this, the brain, to simplify, right? The connections that are made here for some reason match the connections that are in the world. If we wouldn't have the uh, at least potential, right? We have to develop that, right? Through education, for example, you learn math, you learn moral uh, ethics, you learn physics, you learn astronomy, you learn many, many things. But we are the only being, right? Remember Aristotle that is able, has the potential, if reason, uh, if our understanding is developed, to identify these connections. You can ask a dog to explain the, you know, the theory of gravity, he will probably just beg for more food. Right? Why? Because the dog has many potentials, but it's not the potential of understanding in this sense, you know, of logical, and then another aspect. So, so human, being, human beings have reason in the sense, and, and this, the human being's reason matches the order of the whole. So the our, our reason is capable of understanding the order of the world. This is key for luck. Because remember, in, in Hobbes there is no such thing. In Hobbes we are just bunches of matter that is impacted by outside forces and we either like it and we call it good or we recoil, we feel pain, we are afraid of it and we call it bad. So we are just bunches of matter reacting to the environment and giving names to those reactions. But that's not true here, right? There is an order to the whole. There is a way in which the whole is ordered, right? Which, <coughs> which Locke will call the law of nature. And we are able to discover it, to recognize it. You'll see why this is important. So, <coughs> another important uh, aspect of human beings is that we are endowed with, nat uh, with naturally, right, natively, with certain powers. Uh, we have we have certain powers or things that belong to us, like a property, right? So, what are some of these powers or properties? So, life itself is one of these properties. We own our existence. Uh, freedom, the ability to act is such a power, it's also a property. We, we own this ability to do things, right? That's, that's freedom, right? <coughs> and you'll see why this is important. The, po the important, the, the essential part here is that these belong to the human being because he or she is a human being. Human beings have owned the capacity to live natively, right? It's, it's an innate power, it's an innate property. And also human beings own the ability to act freely. And that's an innate power or innate property. So this is what uh, Locke deals with in, in the essay on human understanding, which is one of the books. Two later books are specifically on, on, on um, politics. 
but obviously they connect because you can't answer one question what is how should we live together without ask, asking the question answering what is a human being so uh, the other two books written about politics one is uh, our treatises on government first treatise on government which are, we are not concerned with uh, the second treatise of government which actually remains the one that is most famous and it's most well read so here is where Locke develops his whole theory of the state of nature, what is the purpose of government, and so on. So let's, let's see um, what is this state of nature. Now, if, if the human being is the way I described it, meaning the way Locke described it, let's try to imagine how the state of nature looks like. You have all these individuals <coughs> in a state, just like I remember from, with this, from when we discussed house, in a state without, with no government, right? The state of nature. Again, the state of nature is just shorthand for how would living together, the living together of human beings, look like without the bounds, without the organization of society of politics. Well, in Hobbes we saw. Well, in Locke, well, let's look at these individual human beings. What do they have? Well, first of all, they have life. Right? They have life as an innate power and property. They also have freedom to act. But they also have reason. And that's very, very different from Hobbes. They have this reason that she's able to understand the order of the whole. This reason that is able to understand that we are uh, the order of the whole that en encompasses us all. If the human being has the right to life, remember, so it sounds familiar already, right? The the right to liberty. If these are powers and properties of the human being, of this human being, Jim, well Jim, because he has reason, and because the order of the whole is such that every human being is the same, every human being has these, he is also able to recognize that all the other individual human beings have life as an innate property, and liberty, freedom to act as an innate property. He is able to recognize in every other person the right to life and the right to freedom. But there's another right, or there's another sort of a property, and that is estate. Right? Property in this material sense. Right? Uh, what is property in the material sense? Estate. Right? Something that you own as, a, as, a, as an object, for example. How is it born? Because in the state of nature nobody has anything, right? Except for himself or herself. Right? Has existence and has the power to act. This is this is what you have. You know, human beings has these uh, the human being has these prop innate properties. You see, this obsession with property, it, as your textbook uh, remarks, it has to do with the uh, British context, the political party to which uh, Locke, Locke uh, belonged. Uh, political party in a different way than we understand it today. The Whigs. So um, the human being has these innate things. Life, completely track. How is property born? Is property something external? That it's a convention? What is it? Well, <coughs> um, another aspect in terms of understanding the human being that Locke is insistent about is that if you have an innate power, for example, the innate power to act, whatever that innate power or you know, the power you're born with, right? produces, is also becomes your property. So it's my property, it's something that is, I own, that I'm able to act. My ability to act freely upon the environment is something I own as a power. Because it's an innate power, whatever I produce through, this, through it, through my being, through my ability, my innate ability to act, is also mine. Briefly put, how is property born in terms of estate, things you own, people own? Human beings, God has given, according to law, God has given the world to all human beings indiscriminately. There is no property in an original sense. However, property is born by the individual human being, Jim here, right? Mixing his labor, which is what? His innate power to act, with what? The environment. So Jim here has an axe, cuts this tree, 
clears up this field, well, he has mixed his innate power with an environment that was freely given to all, and thus he has made this his own. By mixing an innate power with the in, uh, neutral world, he has created a state. He has created property. He has incorporated this into his property. So in a state of nature, what do you have? You don't have a world with no, nothing, just like in Hogs, you know, where everything is chaos and fight and war. Dog eat dog and so on. <clears throat> no. You have a world of rational human beings who create property. And naturally, would say Hob, uh, Locke, <coughs> naturally would say John Locke, everybody would develop a certain property because it comes naturally from their powers, and everybody would be fine. As long as they don't accumulate more than they can consume. So this is the natural limit, so to speak. Well, wait a minute. If this is the state of nature, then it's pretty good. Meaning, why do we need politics? Are we missing elections, or politicians, or campaigns, or what is going on here? Because at this point, Locke has depicted a state that is quite idyllic. Or is it, right? So, how does he explain the need to escape this state of nature? Right? In Hobbes it was clear. There's no other way, you better escape it, because otherwise you're going to die, nasty, brutish, short death. Right? So why... Should we want to escape the state of nature? Well, we have everything. Well, different things come into play here. Now, remember that the most essential things that we know, we know that we have life as an innate property, as an innate power. We know that others have it. Because we are able to recognize it, we also implicitly right, have the right to defend this life. Right? And recognize this right, the right to defend life uh, of others. Right? I recognize Mary's right to her own life and her own freedom. So this is the way reason works. This is why the rational people, the, the persons, because they recognize that by the law of nature, by the way things are, we all have these equal innate abilities. And because we're reasonable, we also recognize this and we understand that it's a duty for us to protect life, to protect freedom. And I realize your duty. But then again, why? If we have all this in the state of nature, we don't need the Leviathan to, 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 to enforce it, in the sense of, you know, to declare what's right or what's wrong. So then why would, would we escape the state of nature? Well, several reasons. One is that money. Money is something that comes into play, but remember, money is something that, how is it born, right? It's born, I mean, how do you exchange it? You give something for money, you purchase something with money. The point is that you can accumulate money, this is money. You can accumulate money in quantities that are, well, immeasurable. If property was justifiably yours in as much as it is, it was, exactly what you needed, not more, so that it doesn't just perish, you know, God gave you things so that you use them, he was Protestant, and, but not waste them, right? Money cannot be wasted in the sense of it doesn't go bad. And after it goes bad, money it doesn't go bad. So you can accumulate money in a different way in which you accumulate this um, property, this estate. So one thing is money, and suddenly you will have inequalities of wealth. Suddenly you have imbalance in the force, in the system here. The second uh, aspect or, or reason for escaping the state of nature is that, well, human beings, although they're rational, they're not perfect, right? So they might be able to recognize the law of nature and the right for, and what is just and what is not just, and the right to life, liberty, and property. Sounds familiar. Uh, you recognize this, but when you have a conflict, Jim has a conflict with Mary, right? Who's going to decide between them? Because each of them will say, this is my property, this is your property, this is my right, this is your right. They have a conflict for some reason, the, the land's border or something. Who's going to make justice? Because human beings are not perfect, although they're rational. So implicitly they will be partial. 
So what is needed here is for an impartial judge. An impartial judge that would settle conflict would also be able to enforce that settlement, execute, right? And, and would judge over these uh, people, right? So what you need is an entity or a, a third actor to pass decisions, to execute those decisions, and to pass judgments in terms of in terms of conflict. So what you need is actually an entity to legislate, an entity to execute, an, an entity to what? Judge, judicial. And suddenly, later on, as you see, we'll have what? Three branches of government. Why? Because you know these are rational people, but the point is they're imperfect and partial, so they need to have someone strong enough to execute, strong enough to make laws that are, ju that are just and to put them into, into practice, to put order into this. Order is needed society, for, for the society. What, lacks, what is lacking is order. And to settle conflict, the judicial part. Make order, execute order, settle conflict. A third party. Well, how do these people create that third party? Do they create an absolute arbitrary Leviathan like in Hobbes? No. But they do first the same thing. They give up, they need to give up something. But this, in this point, when, when, it's a, when there's a state of nature, everybody is still, you know, you're on your own, you rely on your own powers. Including the, the right to defend life, to enforce the law of nature. To enforce the order. But each individual enforce, has the individual right to enforce that order to enforce rational order. Obviously these people will clash because they're imperfect. But it's an innate right to, as a rational human being, to recognize and enforce what you know it's right. To enforce the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to property. Because there are so many of them and they clash and there's conflict like I described, and none of them can be the third person in him him or herself, right? What they do is they, just like in Hobbes, together they enter into a covenant, into a social contract, all with all, through which they give up the sole right to enforce the law. It's like the Wild West, when the, you know, you enforce your own law when there was no sheriff in town, right, or around. You had your gun, well, if you, too many people have too many guns and no sheriff, obviously you know what, what's going to happen. Right? <coughs> you need an impartial order. Right? And that is human society. Right? So these people, these individuals, human beings, will enter into a social contract in order to have an impartial body which, which, which can legislate, execute, and pass judgment. So how do they do that? They give up their individual power and rights to enforce the order of nature. But what is the implication of this? The implication of this is, how does this government look? Is it the Leviathan? Is it Hobbes and Leviathan? No, not by, by far. The new society will have a government, doesn't matter how, you know, uh, how many people in power, aristocracy, democracy, one person, monarchy, doesn't matter, that's not the point in, in Locke. The point is, the function. And the, the, the most important point is that it is what a limited government. Again, sounds familiar? You see it does later. It's a limited government, but what does, what is it that limits this government? Well, let's again recall why did we make such a government? Why did we create this government? And if now you're thinking of the Declaration of Independence, you're right. Because it's all a rehashing of these ideas that when a government becomes abusive, you have the right to remove it, and that's Jefferson basically quoting Locke. Is it true though? Right? Let's not buy into all the assumptions, this is why we read other philosophers. We're used to it because this is what's around us, but so were the Greeks used to what surrounded them. So, let's ask our assumptions. So, what is it that limits these governments? 
this government. But obviously, the mission why we made this government, right? It's first of all limited by the law of nature, meaning it is it has very specific functions, right? Legislative, executive, judicial. But what is, are these functions for? They are for the enforcement of the law of nature. And what is the law of nature? It is the recognition that innately we have what? Life. And, and it belongs to us innately, 